editor-in-chief of the Cato Supreme Court Review and senior fellow in constitutional studies at the Cato Institute, Ilya Shapiro, is in Washington for us. Ilya, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We appreciate it. You know, he really, Scalia, he really moved a conservative renaissance, really. Can you talk about his lasting legacy here? Uh, he was the most significant jurist of my lifetime and probably for a while before that as well. Uh, he heralded a, a renaissance of originalism and textualism, that is, that uh, judges and, and scholars actually look to the text of a statute or the Constitution when they're interpreting it. That's actually a, a pretty new thing. Uh, if you look at the opinions of the court uh, before him, they were much less intellectually uh, rigorous. And so now, agree with him or not, in any particular case, we're all essentially playing on the field that he sowed. Yes, yeah, such an important figure, really, in so many ways. I, I have to ask you, though, we have voting rights, affirmative action, labor unions, contraception, abortion, immigration, all issues coming up uh, for the next Supreme Court to decide. Is this a major setback for the conservative legal movement? Well, uh, it depends on the politics of the situation. Uh, even if President Obama nominates and even if the Senate were to go along with someone and confirm uh, the soonest uh, would not be in time to decide these cases from this term. Uh, and so, at, at best, they would be pushed for re-argument uh, in the fall, which again is even closer to the presidential election. Some of these cases uh, would have to be released uh, as a four to four, meaning affirming the lower court without a presidential uh, opinion. Uh, it all really turns on the presidential election. And so uh, the answer to that question, the conservative legal movement, is, is really what happens in the political sphere, uh, much less than anything legal that's going on. You just brought it up, so I want to ask you, what happens with these four four ties this session? What would happen? Well, these are cases, just to tick off the, the top cases that, that are being affected, uh, there's the labor rights case, there's abortion, there's affirmative action, uh, there's voting rights, uh, and a few others. Um, some of the Obamacare's contraceptive mandate is probably the most confused because there are seven different cases. Lower courts have gone every which way. If those are affirmed, if, if a case is, is uh, ultimately decided or not decided 4-4, that means the lower court opinion stands without any precedential weight from what the Supreme Court does. Well, in the Obamacare contraceptive mandate case, the Little Sisters of the Poor and all the rest, uh, that means in some parts of the country uh, that would be in force, in others it would not. So likely that case or series of cases at least would be pushed until we have a full complement of justices. In the others, uh, you would simply affirm the lower courts. That means that uh, President Obama's immigration executive actions stand because the lower court, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the, the injunction stands because that's what the lower courts did. Uh, on affirmative action, it's unclear. Already, uh, Justice Kagan was recused, so we're down to seven justices. Which way does Kennedy go? Does he uh, vote to strike down or, or force uh, a, 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 a reversal? Um, it, it really just depends on what the court internally wants to do with a lot of these different cases. Generally, though, uh, you have to keep in mind that only about 15, 25 percent of the cases end up 5-4. So it's not that the entire work of the Supreme Court comes to a grinding halt. That's, I have to ask you, what is the precedence here? Uh, you know, I mean, it's an election year. You have the president saying he will go ahead and make a nomination, and, and he has the right to do so. But in the GOP debate last night, you know, they were saying either he shouldn't do it or that the Senate should block him. Um, it's kind of interesting because I think the country really wants people to start coming together in a way and work through these issues. And already uh, there hasn't even been anybody elected yet. And you have the pushback on such an important issue like this one. Well, I'm a little self-interested here in the sense that legal pundits have long been wanting uh, judicial nominations to be a, a, a higher priority issue in political campaigns. Uh, and if the Republicans do proceed not to confirm anyone, uh, I think this has to be the number one issue in the presidential campaign. Now, the last time that a vacancy that arose during a presidential election year was filled that same year was in 1940. Uh, the last time that uh, a Senate of the opposing party to the White House filled that uh, uh, vacancy was 1888. Now, it doesn't happen that often, uh, but uh, I think both sides could be justified in saying that, uh, yeah, we need, you know, the, the Democrats, President Obama will be saying we need to confirm, we need to fill up the court. The Republicans, I think, are perfectly justified, and this is, I, I agree on this point, that I think this is too important given the volatility of the electorate, uh, how the Republicans won the Senate in 2014 
Obama, of course, was reelected in 2012. I really think that this transformational decision, because this would uh, uh, shift the court in many ways, should vote until after the presidential election. Now, if Hillary Clinton or another Democrat wins in November, then I think uh, even the lame duck uh, Senate could consider that nominee. Yeah, it's going to be very sticky. <laughs> Who knew that this presidential election could get even more interesting at this point? Ilya Shapiro, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Sure.